I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So I'm here with Dave Berg, author of Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. Dave, how long did you work for Jay Leno? I worked for Jay for 18 years. 18 years, and the book tells, I read the book, it's all about the highs and lows during those 18 years. I don't know if I could ever work for someone for for 18 straight years. Like, why did you, I mean, I'm sure it was an enjoyable, exciting experience, but seems like a lot of work to put together a daily Tonight Show, the most famous show in the world. Sure, but you you know you have to understand over time you actually become. I know this is sounds trite and everything, but when you work with somebody for a, a long time, you actually become sort of like family with them, even if you don't like them. <laughs> you're you're just so used to them. Not only your colleagues that you work with, but the guests that were booked on the show. So uh, it, it, there, w- there was that aspect to it, and also it offered a rare opportunity for anyone in the entertainment uh, community. It, it was a stable place to work. How many people can, in any business can say, I, you know, I had an 18-year stretch, and I could have gone 22 if I had wanted, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you because The Tonight Show was sort of this seminal show for it defined television ever since, I mean, before Carson with Ed Sullivan, with everything, uh, you know, you, you were there with Jay through all of his ups and downs, his fights with the networks. Uh, what was the hardest part about producing the show? I think the hardest part was, I mean, you know, honestly, it, it's not that easy to come up with, you know, fresh material five days a week. A comedy, uh, the comedy machine is like a monster. It just keeps eating up your material. But you learn how to do that on a daily basis. I think it was the outside distractions um, whenever we were in the news, um, uh, you know, the Leno versus Letterman, Leno versus Conan, um, uh, comments by TV critics. I think it was the outside distractions um, that that were the most difficult to deal with. I I can imagine that because I sort of feel like 
everybody, be, because the media controls public opinion in large part, I sort of feel like everybody hated Leno, and yet at the same time, the 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 Tonight Show with Jay Leno was was the most popular Tonight Show. I mean, yeah. So the you know, if you're a logical person, the conclusion to that is everyone didn't hate Leno <laughs> since he was the the number one rated guy in late night. However, um, he he wasn't. He wasn't the number one. Cha- he wasn't the number one choice of the uh, the television credits, the punditry, uh, and those folks. Right, right. So, um, did you ever feel, in a sense, because of your close proximity, not only to Leno but all of these famous entertainers, politicians, and I know you have like a kind of political science background. That was your your primary interest. Because of your close proximity to all the celebrities that were on the show, do you ever feel that there was a, some sense that perhaps you were almost like addicted to that proximity, that the halo effect that these people had? No. I have to really say I, I never got caught up in it. And the reason I didn't is because Jay Leno was, a, a, was an excellent role model in that sense. He just never got caught up in the show business thing. Uh, after the show, he would go home, and or he would go to his his shop and and work on his cars. Um, it, it, I I just really didn't have a problem walking away from it. I it it, it can be addicting, um, but uh, it it for me it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that uh, I I was. I mean, it was a wonderful job to do, and it was an honor to do it. But uh, again, I think maybe because of Jay's attitude about it, that sort of rubbed off on me. And do you think, um, uh, like, did Jay, he, he didn't go out to, like, dinners after the show or the Academy Awards or anything like that? He, um, I mean, if he was invited someplace, it, it's, not, it's not like he was, he, he was rude and never went anywhere. He just didn't get involved in, uh, you know, Hollywood parties and that sort of thing. I always wonder about that. Like, when you see all these, you know, uh, people at the Academy Awards who have obviously made you know hundreds of millions of dollars from their movies. I always wonder what keeps them going. Like I, at night, I like to kind of just relax and go to sleep early and read a book. Like what keeps everybody going after they've reached you know a certain point? Actually, I like that question because to a very very small extent, uh, to a much lesser extent. I notice, uh, like with my book that obviously I'm promoting, that it, it's really if you want to make a wave in uh, in the pop culture, you have to always be self-promoting, and it to me it gets really tiresome actually after a while, and so I don't know what keeps them going, and I, and I'm not saying this to be critical, but you always have to be out there promoting yourself. Yeah, maybe it's this notion that, like, we'll take Jay Leno as, as a great example. Why did he keep going? <laughs> like, clearly he made a lot of money at, at a certain point, uh, much more, I'm sure, than he ever thought he would have when he first started out as a stand-up comedian. Um, what kept him going? I mean, it's hard work to to do a show every day. Well, first of all, he's a workaholic, and I, I don't say that in a critical way, but he really is a workaholic. Um, so there's that aspect. Also, he's a very, just by his very nature, he's very competitive. So I think those factors have sort of have played into it, and that's what kept him going. And, and not only that, he loves, you know, he loves politics, he loves following the political scene, pop culture, and doing jokes. So it, it sort of played into his wheelhouse. You know, a lot of people say that uh, the best aspect of the show was his, you know, kind of stand up in the beginning is his opening monologue, you know, as compared to, let's say, comparing him to the Letterman show. Um, and I know, you know, he, he had a whole team of, of writers uh, helping him with that. How, how often did he write uh, his own comedy? I think um, on a day in and day out basis, he functioned more as the, the editor of the monologue. By the way, he wrote many monologue jokes himself. But on a primary basis, he would go through um, maybe fifteen hundred jokes a day. Oh my God! Again, Fif- fifteen. Sort of work How could you go through fifteen hundred jokes a day? Well, uh, and then he would edit it down to twenty-four. And I think uh, 
what you need to do in, in, in order to, to go through 1,500 a day is you have to have a really short attention span, which he does. Um, he has a, an attention span of about 10 seconds, and, and not saying that critically once again, but, but he, is, um, he is admittedly dyslexic, and often people who are dyslexic, that's uh, associated with having a short attention span. So if, if you've got a 10-second attention span, just think about it. You can, you've got 10 seconds that you'll devote to this joke and this joke and this joke, and, you know, pretty soon you've gone to 1,500 jokes. And I feel he... Also, you have to, you have to work on it 24-7. <laughs> I, I feel he's like, like a very classic sort of comic in the sense that there's sort of like, you know, the setup and then the punchline, setup and then the yeah. punchline. Mm -hmm. and what, what do you think is the key to his comedy like you know and, and he he's been like that ever since he was a stand-up like he was a great stand-up and then you know great monologuist on on his own show well actually it's those are two different art forms uh, interestingly and you're right about the monologue it's it's a very very simple formula and which you've already pointed it out set up punchline but in in your in a stand up act, it's more about telling stories. It's more about telling anecdotes, and I think he shines in in his uh, stand up because he's very plugged into family, and and people relate to family stories. As far as the success of the monologue, I think it was uh, successful because uh, Jay, um, more than any other late night guy, was able to keep. Um, keep tabs of the pulse of America, and he did that by going out and doing stand-ups all over the country, and, and he saw what, what resonated with people, what jokes worked and what jokes didn't. That's interesting. You bring up a couple interesting things. One is um, the emphasis on family. So he was obviously doing stand-up back in the 70s before he got into, um, you know, obviously his, his show. And then you have, you, you know, you fast forward to today's stand-up scene. And what really separated Louis C.K. from the pack was when he decided to focus on family and his personal issues yeah. with family. Yeah, I, I you know, um, that's a very good example. Very, very good example. But, but I think uh, also that's what Jay did. He just, you know, he was really good. Um, his his uh, uh, monologue, or I'm sorry, his stand up, which often will run like two hours, um, is anything but set up punchline. Set up punchline. It's those wonderful stories about him growing up and and stories about other people's families that people really that resonates with people. I think. That, that's really interesting. And so, okay, so now on the setup punchline format, what, you know, going from 1500 to 24, he must have had some internal barometer. Like, what do you think was, was Jay's, what would tip, what would tip the scales that made something funny for Jay? Like, how would you, how would you make Jay laugh? Yeah, well, that's an in interesting question because, um, as with every other uh, thing, thing uh, that that we do, uh, that entrepreneurs do, you never know if your product or your service is going to go over. And the same thing with monologue jokes, you never know what's going to be funny. You just don't. So um, he was constantly trying out jokes on people, uh, on the staff. Um, if you had a busy day, for instance, you didn't want to walk past Jay's office because invariably he would call you in and say, can I run a couple of jokes by you? He was doing that all the time, all the time. And in my case, I was uh, often called in cause, because I uh, had a kind of a sort of a unique perspective at the show. I was sort of known as uh, the fuddy-duddy, the straight-laced guy from the Midwest. So he would often run jokes by me that, you know, hey, do you think this will play in Omaha, or is this a little too edgy? But you know, you know what's funny about that, though, Dave, is that you know, so many of his jokes. You looking back on it now, over the twenty years, so many of his jokes kind of tapped into whatever was going on in the media, in the political world, and now you're telling. I could see from from because I know your interest from the book that probably a lot of that political influence comes from you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, but but um, he, here's the thing. Jay has, has always been topical. 
Uh, of course, he, uh, I know I just said that uh, his, uh, his stand-up is characterized by these wonderful anecdotes about family, and that is true. But he loves politics, and he has always, always been uh, topical. So uh, and my, my contribution to the show, um, not that it's, you know, not, not that, it, uh, that, that the success of the show depended on me. It certainly didn't. It depended on Jay. But I had a background in journalism and covering politics and that sort of thing. So my feeling was, let's, let's book guests that sort of play to Jay's strengths. And he likes politics. And so my feeling was, let's book guests not just from entertainment, but also from the world of politics, um, commentators and journalists, um, um, uh, people, um, sports superstars, these kinds of guests. But it sort of played into Jay's wheelhouse already because he does have an interest in topicality in politics. Well, it's funny, and you, you mentioned um, sports guys. Like, your stories about making sure Dennis Rodman got to the show on time are hilarious like oh thank you 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 literally like what i i understand he was probably a big ratings draw and he was probably a great guest because he's got a lot of internal fire inside himself that that probably comes out on a show like this but given the troubles you had in just making sure he got to the set on time like you flew across country to make sure he got to the set on time why would you book him again well, here's the thing about Dennis Rodman, and, and he appeared about 27 times on, on the show. The thing about Dennis Rodman, if, if, you, if you go back to the uh, halcyon days of the Chicago Bulls, next to Michael Jordan, he was the most recognized character in the world. <laughs> yeah. And every time Dennis appeared on the show, even after his playing days were over, he always, always brought in good ratings. I don't know what it was. People were just fascinated by him. And so obviously we're in the business of getting good ratings. So, um, we, we I, you know, I went out of my day, way to do whatever I could to, to get Dennis Rodman on, despite the fact that he was perennially late. And you mentioned that I flew across the country. I went to Nashville to sort of track him down to make sure he got back to the show on time. But on a routine basis, you know, he lived in Orange County, 50 miles away from the show, and I would send a limo to pick him up, as we do every other guest, but he didn't get in the limo on time. And so I thought, this is just too much hassle. I, you know, I'm too young to get a heart attack. So I would not only send a limo to his house, but I would send a helicopter to the John Wayne Airport nearby. Um, uh, but the problem is he would get in the limo late, and then he would get in the helicopter late, and he still showed up late. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then you would have to rejuggle the guests. Did they ever get offended? Yeah, sometimes. Well, you know that show business. And so, um, what what's the most offended a guest ever got? Like a celebrity guest when when you had to move them around? Not not just for Dennis Robin, but in general. Well, it, it's not like that happened all the time, and it, and it, it also it's not like uh, celebrities get offended. They it's it, I, I don't remember people getting offended. They sort of, you know, they, they go through their own stories in show business. Um, and, and, and I think it's the, the only concern I think that they, they had, many of them had tight schedules after the show, they had to be someplace. And so there would be those types of concerns, but I, I don't know that they got offended. Well, you know, sometimes uh, in, one thing that really impressed me in the book was you mentioned you know, so so getting a good guest, you called a get, and sometimes it would take you. I think one time you mentioned it took you up to six years to get a good get, and it amazes me that it would be so hard to book certain guests for the Tonight Show. Like, if even if someone's like a super celebrity, if they get called to be on the Tonight Show, I can't imagine they would wait six years before saying yes. Well, you mentioned six years, and and the guest that. Um took me six years to book was uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. And the reason he didn't want to come on the show is, is not because um, he, he didn't want to appear on The Tonight Show. It's because he didn't think he was good enough. He, he didn't think he was, uh, his material was good enough or that anyone would have uh, that much interest in what he would have to say. 
That's so, really interesting. I, I thought it was fascinating, but um, uh, still, it, it, it is a little frustrating when you're, you know, when you're in the middle of it and you're in the third year and you're still not making any progress. <laughs> what What were some other guests where you kind of had to really sort of fight them down over over years? Or fight's the wrong word, but really kind of track sure. them down over the course of years. Well, I, I didn't get all of them. That's what's the frustrating part. I mean, at least with JFK Jr., he did agree to do the show, and he, is, he did put on a, an incredible performance on the show. But in many cases, I would put in years and years and years, and they didn't come on the show. Uh, Bill Clinton would be the, the uh, pr- prime example. And that was very frustrating because I spent, you know, more than 10 years trying to book him on the show. And he just, he just never came on. And I call him the get, uh, the, the get I didn't get. And I just tried every which way to, to get him on the show, and he just didn't come on. Well, but um, okay, to be fair to Bill, how do you overcome the, how, what do you answer back when his publicist says, listen, Jay spent an entire year with Monica Lewinsky jokes and Bill's just uncomfortable with that? Sure. Um, and, and I understand that sentiment. I really do. And I think that's the reason he didn't come on. But when you're dealing with people in the uh, the political world, they they're, they never give you really a direct reason they they never really said to me, look, Bill is concerned about the Monica Lewinsky jokes. Um, I did find out sort of through back channels from a couple of sources that that's the real reason he, he didn't want to come on. But it took me years to find out. Usually they just say, hmm, okay, we'll think about it. But, uh, it, it, but Monica Lewinsky... Um, I believe was the reason he he didn't come on, and I I kind of understand his point of view. Although you know the other late night comedians made Lewinsky jokes, and Bill yeah Bill Clinton you know famously went on Letterman, yeah well, that was pre he, pre Lewinsky. But I I think we did um, uh, I think we probably did more Lewinsky jokes than the others. <laughs> I see, and you know so you, so your co- main competition was, of course, Letterman, and to some extent, Jimmy Kimmel. But I feel like you were all kind of talking to different demographics. And so I understand Jay was competitive, but did he ever really make any inroads into the different demographics that these guys were catering to? Well, which demographics do you mean? There might be an interesting answer to this. Okay, you're you're right. I'm sort of speaking off the top of my head, but I would say Jay was catering to... Uh, a slightly older middle America demographic, whereas Letterman was handling the coasts and maybe slightly younger. And Jimmy Kimmel was specifically like the the same demographic as the man show, like really young college, you know, early 20s. Okay. Well, first of all, in terms of demographics, um, once we became number one in 1995, we beat Letterman in total viewers and in demographics, consistently. And during that time when Jimmy Kimmel was on, he was not... Jimmy Kimmel is doing a wonderful job now, but for the longest time, he was not really a factor in late night. He really had uh, very few viewers. Well, it's interesting. I guess now you could say... Um, a, Jimmy Kimmel's probably matured into the job, and B, yeah. um, he and Jimmy Fallon, to some extent, are similar. Like, they're more about, um, like, Jimmy Fallon, you're not really going to see as many political guests, is my guess. Like, he's more about putting on sketches and shows and entertainment more than Jay Leno was, would you say? I would definitely say that. As a matter of fact, I would I give Jimmy Fallon credit for basically reinventing uh, Late Night. He is He is reinvented the, the, the whole genre um, and, and emphasized more pop culture. He's made the guest segments more about performances where he will sing with the guests or he will play games, plays a lot of games, charades or whatever, uh, <laughs> any number of games. And he's made the guest appearances more into performances, um, which is uh, basically taking late night in a new direction. And it's working out very well for him. Yeah, I mean, I think what helps there, like, 
I don't watch, I, I don't stay up late enough to watch them live, but I will watch YouTube clips of the Jimmy Fallon performances with guests. Whereas if I think he was just doing a straight interview, I wouldn't watch those YouTube uh, clips. Well, I read the other day, I'm going to get this wrong, but I thought, I think Jimmy Kimmel, uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy Fallon was n- number one in, uh, I'm sorry, number five in YouTube hits. I mean, he gets, I, I can't remember the, the numbers, but they're incredibly high. And so you are not unique at all. Many people, including myself, now watch Late Night by going to YouTube and watching segments from the shows. Yeah. That's, and it, uh, and I, I don't know if that's good or bad for, for the show. I don't know. Well, well, let's talk about that in general because – you know, it, when you were producing the show, if you wanted to watch Jay Leno, you had to turn in at that time on NBC and watch him interview, you know, James Carville or Hugh Grant or whoever. And you weren't going to watch. There was no YouTube. You weren't going to watch it the next day. So now we have an experience where, you know, much viewing is done next day, uh, whether it's your favorite shows or The Tonight Show or or even, you know, I watch like uh, The Daily Show the next day. And uh, uh, I think that's kind of changed the way people the people's viewing experience. And I, I wonder how you feel that changes The Tonight Show uh, in general. Well, I think you're right. Although, um, you know, people could, could, could have always re- recorded it on uh, the, for their VHS or their VCRs. Um, or their TiVos or whatever, um, but I see we're seeing a lot more of that, and and that's actually factoring into the ratings. And I think at least with Fallon, because people watch the show, maybe not even the next day, but maybe three days later, maybe even seven days later, that may be a reason that he's not as topical in his humor um, as uh, as Jay was. So right, like that. that Oh, yeah. go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's all. I was just going to say uh, what one one uh, result of that, or one consequence of, uh, because of that type of viewing, is uh, there, he's sort of doing humor in the moment, or pop culture humor, or evergreen type jokes that are going to you know be relevant a few days later. I was going to say that the evergreen is seems very important for Jimmy Fallon. Like, like I can go back and watch his. Uh, segments with Justin Timberlake, the history of rap, you know, over and over again, it's it's always going to be evergreen. Whereas Absolutely. J- Jay Leno, Jay Leno was very topical. Like someone, you know, it was classic Tonight Show. Someone had a movie coming out that weekend. You would book them as a guest that week. Absolutely. And to Jay, uh, it w- it was so important to be topical that he insisted on doing five shows uh, a week, uh, one, one each day. All of the other late night shows would do. Um, they would do. Uh, they would work four days, and they would record two shows on Thursday. One one would be aired Thursday, and one would be aired Friday. But topicality was so important to Jay. He he wanted to do a show five days a week. What were what were some of your funnest, or who were some of your funnest guests that you that you liked to book, and they were just fun to have on? Well, actually, <laughs> actually. Um, Dennis Rodman was a lot of fun once he showed up. <laughs> in in what sense? Like he must have just like trashed the green room. No, he he was actually Dennis. Th- this is what's so interesting. He was very low key. He was very kind to all of the uh, to you know. J O was said that he, that he could tell the character of a guest by the way they treated everyone, including the security guard, the makeup person, the producer. All the all the people backstage, and and Dennis was always a very very sweet guy, and it was always very important for him to, you know, try to be try to make Jay laugh as much as possible. So he would spend thousands of dollars, five, six, seven thousand dollars on these outrageous outfits just to get a rise out of Jay. <laughs> That's funny. So that was a that was a lot of fun. I also felt that um, sometimes the funniest people on the show were not the comedians. Um, Charles Barkley, for instance. Barkley just made, all you had to do was look at Barkley, and he could say anything, and, and it would make me laugh. He just had a natural, uh, he just was a natural when it came to being funny. 
Uh, I also thought Shaquille O'Neal was a, na- a natural comedian. And so I really enjoyed when, when those guys came on. Why do you think and, why yeah. do you think comedy and laughter are so important on a late night show as opposed to let's say a, a Good Morning America or Today Show type of show? Well, they have a different uh, they have a different um, mission, and their mission is is news and and to inform people. Although the lines are really blurring, <laughs> you, see, you see a lot of uh, enter- entertainment people. Uh, on those shows, and um, so, sometimes the hosts can can put out pretty good zingers themselves. Right, but but, but their their mission was more news and information. Ours is uh, the Tonight Show is an entertainment show. But what if you took like Jimmy Fallon and you said, um, "Okay, Jimmy, we're taking the Tonight Show away from you, but we're giving you the Today Show, and we want you to do the exact same thing." Do you think it would not be popular? I, I don't think it would work in the morning because. I think people actually turn on the Today Show or Good Morning America or the, the CBS Morning Show or Fox and Friends. They they kind of want to know what's going on in the world. I guess that's right? true. Isn't, isn't that why people watch? I, I guess mean, that, I, it's because you know, we train them to watch yeah. that way, though. Like, what if we said, don't worry about the world. We're going to wake you up and make you laugh. <laughs> well, actually... Um, you, now, now, if if somebody is listening to this podcast, a, a producer, maybe you'll give somebody an idea. In other words, r- run a show that's not about news in the morning, is what you're saying. Yeah, or put like John Stewart on we... the Today Show every day. Yeah, well, they wanted to put him on Meet the Press, so right, right, but he maybe, didn't. Maybe he didn't want to be uh, caged in to that to that format. I think. Well, it's just that uh, satire and humor. It's a uh, you know that's a different thing than news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting the debate on that because many people, of course, watch uh, John Stewart for their news. And so, how would you deal with that from the Jay Leno show? How would how would I deal with well, the uh, fact the fact that I... John Stewart was kind of making himself a name as a comedian that you would watch to get the news? You know, as opposed to let's say a Leno or a Letterman. Well. You know, be, before John Stewart established his 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 niche, although it's a big niche, it's a huge niche. They were saying the same thing about Leno and Letterman, that people would would tune into Leno and Letterman to get their news. So it's 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 not that different. You know, it, it's sort of I don't know if you remember on the Larry Sanders show from HBO series, the Larry Sanders show, when there was a, a series of episodes where Larry Sanders felt really threatened that John Stewart was going to that the network was looking to um, replace Larry Sanders with John Stewart. And even though it was a fictional story, you know, it's that kind of level of competition that I think is probably very real among Tonight Show hosts. Yeah, that's true. Although he, here's the thing about John Stewart, I happen to be a big fan of his, by the way, and um, I think that uh, he his his attitude uh, about the the meet the, meet the press that that's not what he does. Uh, I really respect him for that. But uh, actually, uh, John Stewart, we ne- he was really more of a niche guy. I mean, you know, we were we were pulling in in the Halcyon years five million viewers, and he's pulling in a million or less. Right. He was never, we really never considered him a, to be a competitor. Right. But I guess course, also because it's cable. Yeah. So he's just so, not going to uh, hit his. We, ne- we never thought of uh, John, uh, John that way. We were really more focused on Letterman. It was more about Letterman. And actually, actually, the show that really brought in uh, very good numbers was Nightline. Right. Very often, Nightline was beating Letterman. Right, but but you is, but you guys were the winners. No, that's right. But but what I'm saying is, we didn't really think of uh, Stewart as a competitor. And, and I'm not saying that to be insulting. He just didn't bring in the number. Right. Now, now it's a different world. You know, I, I'm not saying that it's it hasn't changed. It has changed today. John Stewart is a is is a huge factor. And he gets a, a lot of hits, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I sort of think as kind of a, a force to be listened to, 
people listen to John Stewart, you know, what did he say about this political event? And no one is looking to any other late night show host at this point other than John Stewart to see what they said about a certain event. There's no question about it. I, and I, I'm included in that. So, so, but, but you did have a lot of political guests, like for instance, Sarah Palin after the defeat. That was a great story. Uh, w- tell us about that. Well, Sarah Palin, uh, I had, my, my goal was to book her as a, a vice presidential candidate. I thought she would have been a, a, a great booking, whether you like her or not. She, at that time, if you, if you go back to that period of time, um, she she was, you know, she drew a lot of attention. Uh, however, her campaign um, decided to sort of reel her in after they had had her appear on, with uh, Katie Couric, which I think was a huge mistake. To, to have her make that appearance. Right. So, um... That was almost like a I, trap that CBS set for her. Well, if you're Katie Couric and you're struggling in, in the evening news, Katie Couric was number three. She never really did that well at CBS News. I mean, if, if you're Katie Couric, aren't you going to be looking to, to, to uh, uh, do something, anything, when you have Sarah Palin on to, to create a ripple? which she did. I just think it wasn't a good booking. I, so anyway, after that, the campaign just pulled in its horns, and uh, which I think was a big mistake. I, I think Sarah Palin would have been great during the campaign. But I didn't give up, and I could, uh, you know, it took me another you know, year and a half to get her booked, but I finally did get her booked. And so she came in, though, and that was a, that was a relatively expensive one for you guys. Yes, it was. Um, she... Um, she was up in uh, Anch- Anchorage, Alaska, and um, it's very, very family-oriented person. And basically, what uh, what she said was, "Look, I would love to do the show, but uh, my family is going to have to come with me, um, and so um, you're gonna you're gonna have to charter a jet." And and we did. We agreed to do it, and NBC agreed to it, and we flew her down for like thirty five thousand dollars. And that was a decision. We decided that was a good choice, that, that she would be a good guest. And the reason is the timing was great for us. We had just come off the Jay Leno show, which was the uh, primetime show that we did that wasn't, wasn't exactly that successful. Mm-hmm. And Jay was just uh, launching the second version of, uh, of his second version of The Tonight Show. And we booked her... Uh, during the first week on the, the second launch of The Tonight Show. So, it, you know, $35,000 was a good investment. Did you, did you think, um, did you consider doing anything funny, like having kind of Tina Fey on first, p- pretending to be her, and then bring in the real Sarah Palin or anything like that? No, because it was just, first of all, uh, I don't think Tina Fey or Sarah Palin would have gone for it. Right. Uh, Tina Fey had already said that she was sick of playing Sarah Palin. On, I mean, she had already said some very negative things about Sarah Palin. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and it was it was complicated enough just getting Sarah Palin to come. Right. What so you... I, what I did do is I suggested that Sarah Palin should do her own stand up, and that seemed to go over really well. She liked that. What what suggestions did you make during the years that uh, Jay didn't go for that you think would have been very good? Wow, you know what? I'm not sure I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think it probably came in the form of um, certain guests that, you know, for, first of all, when you work at any show, just expect to get shot down 95% of the time. Right. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. And so when we talk about this, I'm not being critical of the show for not taking my ideas. But honestly, I, I thought that we could have booked um, maybe some more people from from the world of uh, news and commentary. They, they they usually did a really great job, um, and 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 fewer people from entertainment. But that's just my own bias. Well, it, it's funny because entertainment. I think a lot of those guys have this halo effect where that you everybody's going to think they're going to going to be more interesting, but the reality is they play interesting people on TV shows or movies, but they might not be so interesting personally, like in real life. Well, the 
the thing about actors is um, that you just described it. They, uh, the, uh, some talk shows are sometimes a challenge. I'm only talking about actors in a general sense. Many actors are great storytellers. Um, they're, they're terrific storytellers. Tom Hanks would be an example. But Tom but Hanks, uh, Tom Hanks is, I would say, is at heart a comedian. That's right. He does have a comedic sense. And your bosom buddies um, was his first show as a sitcom. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I recall. Yeah, I do recall that. But um, I, I think, in general, I think sometimes uh, many actors do struggle with talk shows because they're used to reading scripts. Uh, they play other people, and many of them would actually say, you know, I hate to say it, but I kind of live a boring life. I go to the set and I come home. <laughs> so um, that's why I sort of liked, you know, going outside of, of uh, entertainers myself. And who? And I wish we had had more. P- I, I wish we had had even more bookings. Those types of bookings. Who, who who were your favorite comedians that you ever booked on the show? Well, you might be surprised at my favorite, uh, Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> okay. I love loved working with Larry because he was only playing a character. If you talk to Larry, you know, um, the, the, the person, he was, you could talk to him about anything, Shakespeare, um, the, what was going on in politics, the latest music. He was a really bright guy. And w- what other, uh, what other comics? I would say, uh, uh, and, and the, re- say the reason I ask is because Johnny yeah. Carson sort of defined the 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 stand up comedy world. Like you, you were made, you were a made man if you were invited to sit now next to Johnny Johnny Carson after your set. And it was yeah. so, the Tonight Show was the pivotal show for stand up comics. So that's why I'm just curious. No, who, yeah, but but I I may not be. I may not, you know, other, my uh, uh, colleagues that worked at the show would have different answers than I do. Um, I also enjoyed working with Don Rickles huh. uh, because I thought that he was, uh, he was amazing. He was, he, I mean, at his age, um, in his 80s, he's doing in-the-moment comedy. He, he's, he's out there without a net. He's just making it up as he's going along. And that always really impressed me. Of course, Robin Williams, it doesn't, didn't get any better than than he was. Right, he would be right at the top of my list. And uh, and but, who did yeah. who did Jay who would make Jay laugh the most? Like what did Jay? What was well, I, I'm always curious. Like Jay probably has been in the comedy world longer than just about anybody. And I'm just curious. So he's he's clearly put in his forty thousand hours of mastery on comedy. And I'm just curious, what makes him laugh? Like what does he find funny? Well, I think, like the rest of us, he, he loved Robin Williams. I mean, he, he said that. And he was, you know, good friends with Jerry Seinfeld. Um, and Chelsea Handler, we kind of broke her on our show. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. The character and, yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah. But I, I think Jay also, I think he, uh, I think he, he, he like, uh, like myself... I think he loved it when somebody like Charles Barkley came on and just killed, right? And he wasn't even a comedian. That's great. And so, you know, it's interesting. I I was interested when I was reading your book because, you you know, as a podcaster, it's not quite, you know, The Tonight Show, of course, but it's almost like having a talk show. And there's, there's similar problems in which, you know, how do I find guests? How do I book guests? How do I, you know, you know, how does the podcast world compete with things like The Tonight Show or not that not that there's any competition in terms of numbers or anything like that. But like for me, I want to produce a quality, entertaining and valuable show to my to my listeners. Like what what advice do you have for such a bare bones kind of format like like podcasting? I think you already uh you, you already uh, sort of hinted at it. You were mentioning earlier that maybe not the best guests are, are as a group, you know, these big Hollywood stars. There are a lot of really fascinating people out there, um, authors, uh, people from the academic world, 
uh, people from the business world um, that 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 actually are, are are very interesting in in and of their own right. Right, but you're but but like let's say you're at the Tonight Show and you're trying to figure out how are people going to turn to my channel versus the Letterman. You kind of have to have that celebrity factor a little bit. No, it's, the celebrity factor is everything. It dictates everything, and so in in that sense, we were sort of limited in a way. Yeah, interesting. Um, but where, whereas whereas you don't have those limitations. Although I might, because the celebrity factor works here as well. Like, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. c- celebrity, and it's funny. Celebrities don't always get you the most downloads on a podcast, which is how, which is the metric we go by. But uh, you know, often people who deliver the most value get the most downloads, which is as it should be. But um, they will get subscribe. They will get people checking in. Oh, who does he have now? Um, you know, because th- there's a curiosity factor. Well, we we discovered after a while that there were only about ten names in in uh, the, the world of Hollywood. Only about ten that really made a difference. And even they, you couldn't rely on them. As time went on, even they um, weren't a guarantee for good ratings because they kind of showed up on all the shows. So, so really, the factor was. Jay's personality and his and his monologue and then his what is interview style his own personal approach to the guests. Well, it's it's about the host. That's true. But if you can bring in, for instance, Barack Obama as the first uh, sitting president ever to do a late night show, that's going to make a difference. If you can bring in uh, Mitt Romney and nobody else brings him in at at the height of the, the campaign. That's what made a big stir. These were these were unusual bookings. I see. So unusual bookings, um, you know, that were not just the usual kind of late night fare would be would move the needle for you. Yes, because the the big stars you're going to kind of see them on all the shows, right? They have they have movies to promote. I get it. They they you know what, what you try to do is get them first, right, before the other shows. But basically, people know they're going to, if they're on Leno, they're going to be on Letterman and all the morning shows. So, um, you know, I I think what really made a difference for Leno that that really kind of um, made him sort of stand out was the emphasis on the on the on the political guests. And, and, And we really basically from 1996 on, we basically had all the major presidential candidates. Well, and also, I mean, I, I have to imagine one of your most popular shows ever was Schwarzenegger essentially announcing for governor on your show. <laughs> yes. I had never seen anything like that. I think I watched that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about that booking is we didn't know. We expected him to say that he wasn't running, right? And we were led to believe that by his staff. Um, and we basically thought when he showed up, he, he was just going to, you know, going to basically say he wasn't running. And then he was going to prom- promote Terminator 3, which, which had come out at, at that around that time. Yeah. But he had sort of, uh, uh, Schwarzenegger had sort of hinted that he was thinking about running. And again, we thought it was just a, a, it, it was it was just a way of promoting Terminator Three, and so when he actually made the announcement, we were shocked. We the staff, Jay was shocked, and Schwarzenegger's staff was shocked. I saw them; their mouths dropped. They couldn't believe it. That's funny. So, so, I, it's it's really funny. Now Schwarzenegger himself has said that he didn't even think. Uh, you know, it didn't occur to him. He didn't make up his mind to make that announcement until he got in the limo and and came over to the show. Which I don't, I don't really buy that. I really don't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the rush of like being on the Tonight Show and having that opportunity to shock the planet is is overwhelming. Well, but see, a, a year later, I had booked Maria Shriver, his wife, his then wife. And I had asked her about that. At, at what point did, did Arnold make a decision? And she said that the two of them had talked about it extensively and that, that, that he had made that 
you, you know, that she kind of knew that she knew it was coming. I see. So, so, you know, maybe it's a little bit of one and a little bit of another, you know, we don't really know the full, the full answer. I guess, but I don't think he made up his mind in the limo on the way over. I right. don't buy that. Right. And so how did you get Barack Obama to get on the show? As the first sitting president. He came on several times, but his first booking as president um, was a big coup for us, maybe our biggest coup, uh, and, it, and it, it, it happened on his 59th day in office of his first term. And what had happened is um, I had sort of worked on that, for, uh, on that booking for going back about five years, Wow, and I uh, I had uh, I recall watching the Democratic convention in 2004, and uh, he was the keynote speaker at that an unknown Illinois senator, John Kerry was the standard bearer for the Democrats. Right, and not a particularly exciting guy, right? Whether you like him or not, not a really exciting guy. But Barack Obama, when he gave that speech, which I think was I don't know, was maybe 12 minutes. It wasn't a long speech. I'm watching this speech, and I'm going, this guy's an incredible communicator, the best communicator I've seen in the political world since Ronald Reagan. So I decided the next day that I would start calling his people, because I felt like that uh, he was going to be the future of the Democratic Party. And so I just sort of established a relationship with his staff, and I just you know, stayed in touch with them over the years. And then when, then he came on a couple of times before he was president, once as an author and once as a presidential candidate. So I think, I think he established a very good relationship with Jay and, and trusted Jay, and they had a good rapport. So I, I, th- I think it, the, it was that buildup that led to the booking. That's interesting. So, like, I often, like, if I ask for a guest to come on to my podcast and they say no, I often have a slight feeling of rejection, even though it's, you know, most of the, most people I ask are, are going to, to reject me. Um, not most, but like, if I go out and ask Barack Obama, he's gonna not even respond. And so, but you would spend time kind of cultivating a, a relationship. Uh, and, and, and what would that mean? Like, would you just sort of call up and say he can come on anytime he wants, no pressures? Like, how would you kind of cultivate that relationship? I, I think what you do is is you just sort of make a call every once in a while, and you go, how are things going? And you sort of talk about, well, here's the latest news and gossip in, in Hollywood. What's going on? What's going on in Chicago? What's What's the what's the latest in the in the political world? And you just have conversations like that over the year. I and see. So you would you would difference. give a little. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know what? I email my potential guests. Maybe I should call a little bit more. Well, you you know, it's here's the thing. It hasn't been that many years where people would regularly go to emails. That's only a recent development. <laughs> Right, you know, but I do find that telephone calls are useful sometimes. By the way, I did use email as well, but I do think there's nothing like a conversation, a back and forth, where you're just establishing a relationship. And so you're calling their publicists in most cases, like particularly it, it for was, actors. Well, uh, for for political people, it's it's like press secretary, or you, you know, they have a different name, but 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 basically. Their publicist, and what do you think? What do you think is going to happen next? Just in general, like to television, like and particularly like broadcast television. It, it seems like there's almost no more real need for it. Like, how does it stand? How will it stand out compared to uh, you know cable and YouTube and now Netflix and Amazon Studios and so on, and podcasts and podcasts, yeah. I wish I knew the answer to that. We are uh, sta- standing at the crossroads, and we don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, the, the, uh, the only thing I think we do know is that, um, you know, big uh, shows that appeal to everybody, like the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Uh, I, I think I think we've seen the end of that. I, I think that's over. Um, basically, as you've already po- pointed out, 
Jimmy Fallon, who probably has the, the you know, the, the broadest, most mainstream audience, even he is appealing, you know, more to younger viewers um, uh, than the others. So I think it's going to become more and more of a niche world. And how are Jimmy Fallon's numbers compared to, like, let's say, Jay Leno's numbers eight years ago? Oh, uh, Jimmy Fallon, maybe he's bringing in three and a half uh, million and Jay was bringing in five million. He doesn't have the same numbers Jay did, but of course we both know it's about the hits on YouTube and that's where Fallon really shines. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting too, because it's like in the book business, you know, there's probably less blockbusters now, even though there are more books published, there are less blockbuster books published than there were, let's say 20 years ago. That's right. And the, yes, the book business is going through the same kind of transition as broadcasting, which is going through the same transition as the music field. All of media is going through a huge transition. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I definitely, I'm always interested in this now because, again, so, so you know, as someone who podcasts, you know, it's it's interesting just trying to, uh, again, be as entertaining as possible, deliver as much value as possible, have the best guests. You know, it's a, it, you had a hard job for 18 years. That's why I, I, kudos to you for, for really doing such, you know, having the best show on television for, for so long. Well, thank you for saying that, but I did have the advantage of, of having an established brand name. Yeah, Jay. So you could get on the show and say, this is Dave Berg with The Tonight Show or this is Dave Berg with uh, uh, Jay Leno, and that made a huge difference. It, to, to be able to have a brand name, you're out there, you don't have a brand name. And, and I'm in the same position, by the way, when, I, you know, when, I'm, when I'm calling people for, for various things. I'm no longer Dave Berg with The Tonight Show. I'm just Dave Berg. It makes a huge difference to have a brand name. Was that a shock to you when you first let, left The uh, Tonight Show? Well, I found out that, you know, people didn't return my calls as much or didn't didn't respond to my emails and, you know, bruised my ego a little bit, but I got over it. Yeah. Because well, it wasn't about me when I was, it was about, it was about me as a representative for The Tonight Show. Right, right. And, and, and then, look, that became a part of your identity. Having done it so long, it right. must, it must have been a little shock. Yeah. Well, Dave, so so the book is Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. The stories are hilarious throughout it, and it's a very interesting um, story of basically how to build a, a TV show, and it's it's just great. I, I love the book. Well, you're very kind to say that. I do appreciate that. And, thank you. And and thanks so much for coming on the on the podcast. Uh, I, I learned a lot, and I hope the listeners learn a lot as well. So So thanks once again. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, James. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, 
Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.